In this video, I'm going to be covering some important numbers and concepts I think all programmers should know. It'll help you in pretty much all areas as a developer. For example, if you want to estimate cost of your own side project before you take the time to implementing and writing a bunch of code, uh, you can use this stuff to make those rough estimates and give you an idea whether it's even profitable. It'll also help you avoid a nightmare scenario where maybe you have a small side project and all of a sudden it goes viral and the person's left with thousands of dollars in cloud hosting bills. I've read about that all the time. So this can help you get a rough estimate of where you should set a billing alert or shut down the service automatically rather than risk uh, losing a bunch of money. It's also use useful for if you're working in a company and you're thinking about adding a new feature and you want to estimate how much it would cost per user to add that feature, you can do a rough estimate that way. Um, it also help you with general system design so that you know uh, what the trade-offs are, what are the areas that are going to hurt performance of your application, and in the simplest way, knowing this stuff, if you're doing an interview for a job, it'll really help you um, on those system design type interviews. First thing we're going to look at is latency, which has a big impact not only on user experience, but also on how you design your entire application to reduce latency. So over here we have the actual times which are kind of hard to wrap your head around because it's nanoseconds, milliseconds. So I've converted this to actual, um, more understandable. I've scaled it up to one second for CPU cycle, and you can see how it gradually goes down. So this is like when you're running calculations, your CPU can, ca can cache data that it needs, and it can, can perform those calculations very fast. Once you have to start reaching out to other areas to get the data you need, uh, things start getting a lot slower. So RAM or main memory, this would be stuff like if you've heard about caching, um, this is still pretty fast. Uh, you can see it's six minutes, so it's not bad and it's much better than going out to disk. So if you've heard about how database calls are slow, this is why. And you can see um, the difference between grabbing something from a cache like Redis or going to the database. It goes from six minutes to six days, and that's what they um, more expensive and up-to-date solid-state drive. If you're using an old-school hard drive, it goes up from 6 days to 10 milliseconds, which converts to 12 months. So that's a massive difference. And even worse would be calls to other data centers. So here you're limited by the speed of light. So if you have to, um, if you don't have data locally in a certain data center and you have to go reach out to another one, you can see that your performance drops off horribly. So that's gonna come into play when you're designing a system. You wanna make sure whenever possible that you have your data locally so that you can run your app faster. Milliseconds might not seem like a huge deal, but if you've ever been playing an online video game and you've been lagging, you can tell uh, how frustrating just a few extra milliseconds can be for your users. So that's something you always wanna keep in mind. Uh, to make it, or to help make more sense in your head, I've drawn kind of a diagram of how you can picture this because just the numbers doesn't really help you much. So let's say in this case you're working on a problem like a application would be. Uh, the CPU would be kind of to extend it to a desk or a real world with you as the computer, the CPU would be your brain. It's stuff that right off the top of your head, whatever data you can memorize, you don't have to really go and access it. So it's obviously much faster. Going to RAM would be like having a book or something on your desk that you can quickly flip through, grab the information you need, and then do whatever you uh, need with it. Beyond that would be disk, so maybe you have a lot, like a library or a bookshelf in your own house, so you leave your office, you go to that bookshelf, you grab the book you need, get the information you need, then you go back to your desk. A network call outside the data center which is obviously slow, would be like walking to the library, having to check out the book, get the information you need, then go back to your house and use that information for whatever you're working on. So uh, the obvious takeaway, and to kind of make it more concrete, because numbers always don't uh, work as well as a visualization, is you want to, whenever possible, keep the data you need close by to your application. The key takeaways then are you want to avoid network calls whenever possible. Um, you also want to avoid hits to your database, so keep frequently accessed data in memory with a cache if possible, rather than continuously going to your database. A lot of distributed system stuff is related to latency and how to deal with that. So, um, for, 
example, one reason to replicate data is obviously for disaster recovery. Uh, you want it so that if one data if one data center goes down, you don't want to lose all your data. But it's also beneficial to have that replicated so that if necessary, you can serve it as close to the user as possible. And that's the same concept behind CDNs, content distribution networks, is that you can take advantage of having um, a service that gives you and serves your data as close to a user as possible. Another example, this is MapReduce and kind of how it would work. So Google, early when they were scaling, they had big issues with networking inside their data center where they had too much data moving back and forth. And to help uh, solve that issue, they used or they created MapReduce to do bit calculations on big data. Instead of having one big server run those calculations where it would have to reach out to other servers that held the data, pull it back through network, and run the calculations on it, they created this system where they were able to have each server that already held the data, it would run the calculations locally, and then it would send the result to a um, another server that basically at, puts together all those different calculations and gives you the um, end result. And that was all to reduce network latency and the amount of bandwidth going through their um, through their data centers. So the example here is like, the equivalent would be, let's say you got a bunch of different piles of rocks, these would represent servers with data on them. Um, the obvious way to do it, which is what MapReduce does, is that you would go to each of these, you would count the rocks, and then you just add them together. The naive way, which is how a lot of applications actually work, if they haven't taken this into account, is that it would be like going to each of these piles, grabbing the rocks, moving them back to where you were, and then counting, going back, moving them all back here to count from the st spot you started at, and just continuously doing that. So you can see how inefficient that would be carrying things back and forth rather than just walking to them, counting right here, and then going back and using those results. So that's kind of another real world example where this stuff seems really complicated. Stuff like MapReduce, when you hear people talk about big data and all that, it seems very complicated, but it's really not. The concepts behind it uh, if you use a real-world example, are pretty simple. Next up, we're going to go over some quick math for making capacity estimates so that you can kind of get a rough figure of the type of resources and server amounts and stuff like that you're going to need. First up are some basic data conversions. So um, 8 bits equals 1 byte, uh, and uh, 1,024 bytes is actually 1 kilobyte. So that's a pretty frequent... Um, error is that you assume it's like metric so it would be a thousand but because computers work with binary it's actually 1024 so it's not a huge deal when you're making rough estimates but it's always good to know that so you can see that same value for each megabyte gigabyte you've probably heard about those all before but we're going to be using these conversions for when we're making estimates common data types so a char is one byte that is um, so if you have like messages in your application you're gonna have every character in a string is one char you're gonna have integers which are four bytes and that if we go if you think about why that is if you've heard about a 32-bit integer obviously 32 bits one one uh, byte is eight bits so you have 32-bit integers four bytes and then you have Unix timestamp uh, which is four bytes so it's always good to um, know your time conversions and keep just kind of maintain these or memorize these so that you can make quick estimates for daily traffic. Um, really common is like requests per second, how many you need to handle and stuff like that. So you can see obviously 3,600 seconds per hour, multiply that by 24, you get um, 86,400 seconds per day and roughly if you want to estimate rough uh, monthly traffic, you got about 2.5 million seconds per month. So once you know how many total requests you're getting, you can just divide it by each of those values to get uh, requests per month, hour, day. So it's always good to have those conversions probably memorized just because it makes things easier. So now let's put this into practice. We're going to do some example calculations for an Instagram type app. So first up, we'll do a traffic estimate. Which the formula for this is going to be um, your a average daily active users, and then you're going to multiply for average amount of reads per user and writes per user. 
So in this case, we're going to say we have 10 million average daily active users, and the average user they make they view 30 photos. So that's like they refresh their timeline. Maybe they scroll down a couple times, and they see 30 posts or 30 photos. Um, and simple math, that means you're getting 300 million photo requests per day. For rights, we have the same amount of daily average users, but some people will upload multiple times per day. Other people will upload maybe once a month. So that gives us an average of one per day per user. And that gives us our 10 million. So then we can use these times. So this is our daily numbers of seconds per day. Um, so every day taking this, we can see we got 30, 400 requests per second and about 115 writes per second and this is usually a pretty in almost all cases a web application is going to have much more read requests than writes and getting this um, having your knowing your average users how much uh, requests are making that's why people talk about a lot about analytics and stuff like that uh, it's very valuable to have that information so that you can make these estimates it's also worth noting that um, external requests don't always equal the same amount as internal. If you're using microservices, it's pretty common that one external request like this could cause um, dozens maybe of internal because you have to make calls to the photo service, microservice. Uh, you might have a video service, analytics, logging, all that type of stuff. So one external request uh, can always is going to mean probably you're going to have more internal requests, but for now that's really not a big issue. Next up we have our memory estimate. So for this we're going to use that value we got for our read requests per day times the average size of our request and we're going to multiply that by 0.2. And the reason for that is our 80-20 rule, which is that generally speaking for a rough estimate you can assume that 20% of your data will be 80% of your overall requests or traffic. Not all especially on a social media site, some posts are going to get much more views than others. So a popular count, their post is going to get viewed millions of times. Other people's posts might not get viewed at all. So to help save our database, what we're going to do is cache our most popular stuff, our most frequently accessed data to, like we talked about earlier, reduce latency. Instead of serving our popular data from our database and disk, we want to store that in memory to really speed up how fast users get that information. So we're going to take our 30 million requests and we're going to make an estimate that for like an Instagram post, you have the username, you have um, stuff like the description, the written text. We'll just do a rough estimate of 500 bytes per post and that comes out to 150 gigabytes. We then multiply that by 20% or 0.2, which means we're of that total data we have, we have 150 total, we only really need to store 30 gigabytes of the most popular or most frequently accessed. And then we also need to multiply that. We want replication on our cache, so for a rough case we'll have three total cache servers, uh, two as backups, and that gives us a total of 90 gigabytes because we don't want a single cache server. Like Technically we could save money by only having one with the 30 gigabytes, but if that goes down then our entire application is going to be in trouble when we have a bunch of requests going to our database. Now bandwidth requirements, the formula for that is just request per day again, times request size, so 300 million requests again. For this one, we need to account for also the photo that we'll be serving. That would generally be served from like a CDN. So we're going to estimate the average photo size once we compress it and stuff is one megabyte plus the 500 bytes from like the text and username and all that other data. So that comes out to 450,000 gigabytes per day. And if we d divide that by the number of seconds in a day, our peak, or our average actually, bandwidth is going to be 5.2 gigabytes per second. It's worth noting again that rarely is an application going to have like a steady flow at the same rate. You're often going to have a lot of peaks where um, at your highest usage time you might have three times the bandwidth. Um, and during dead times you might have much lower amount. So Netflix for example, um, once people get off work in the U.S., they obviously have much higher peak traffic compared to during the working day because at least most people don't have, aren't watching Netflix during the middle of the day. And finally, we have our storage estimates. So for this, we're going to take the number of writes we get per day times the size of those writes and times the amount of time we want to store the data. 
So we get 10 million writes per day. Um, average, like I was before, 1.5 megabytes for the photo and the other information, which comes out to 15 terabytes per day. If we take that, there's 365 days in a year, and then we also, um, you're gonna wanna hold stuff for a long time, 10 years, maybe longer, if you're an established company. So you can estimate that long-term storage uh, is gonna be around 55 petabytes. So you'd use this to estimate all these things we've gone over once you have your analytics and you can say, okay, for our average user, we're making this much money. If it's an Instagram, you can calculate how much money you're making per user on ads. And then you can look at the storage cost, the bandwidth cost, all that other stuff. And you can then find out if your idea is profitable or not. So that's pretty important. Before you take the time to make an application and go through all that effort, you wanna see if it's even viable. Even if you don't have the user analytics data because you haven't actually tested anything, it's a good idea to at least try to estimate this stuff so that you can, um, if, you're pinching, if you're pitching to a venture capitalist or whatever, you can at least give them some sort of estimates. So that's it for this video. I just wanna go over some quick numbers and math, not go really in depth, but give you an idea of what type of stuff you should be paying attention to. Um, I think it'd be a good idea to take some of these conversions, think of some different ideas for an app. So this, we did a photo app. Um, you can come up with maybe a video streaming app or something else and run through some um, calculations, use these formulas and just do some practice and it'll become pretty natural after a while. Um, it's not like it's real complicated math. It's mainly just converting between units and doing stuff like that. So I think that's a good practice that you could do. Uh, if this video helped you, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more videos I'll be doing on system design and related topics. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to leave a comment below.